Hello, engineering students. Here we are. Uh, I believe this is week 20A, first one of uh, week 20. And today's lesson is going to be just a little bit different. Uh, no less important, but just some different ideas and things. For a start, on the screen right now, we have Name That Musician. A little obscure, maybe for some of you. This is Mr. John Foreman. <clears throat> John Foreman, fun fact, actually came to our school and uh, gave a little mini concert at Christ Presbyterian Church. Uh, that was, man, maybe four years ago now. I enjoy his music. Uh, he's in the band Switchfoot. He does a lot of indie stuff as well. And I've got him on the screen because he once said something that I uh, read in a little article, and I've never quite forgotten the idea. It's one of those simple, enduring ideas that just kind of sticks with you. <clears throat> and here's what it is. He was asked about his music. He does kind of like, you know, what you might call Christian music. And then he does stuff which seems to be like less so, like kind of worship music. But then stuff that is more like, I don't know, like not. <laughs> um, and so he was once asked by a Christian music magazine <clears throat> um, if he wrote Christian songs. Okay, that was the question. So do you write Christian songs? Do you do Christian music? And I thought John had a really interesting response. He said, well, let me challenge you there. Can you have a Christian song? Like, what does that mean? The word Christian is supposed to be applied to a person who is following Christ. You know, who is a, a little Christ is what that word I'm told means in the Greek, Christian. So, you know, how can you have a song that's following Christ? You can have Christians who write songs, and he, he would say, yes, I, I, that's what I am. But, you know, he just challenged that idea that you have Christian music and non-Christian music. Because a song is not saved. It is not Christian. It's, it's just a song. Um, so in the same vein, I've often asked myself other questions in a related way. Can you have a Christian building? Okay. Could you have... Christian furniture. We've been designing furniture. Can you have a Christian couch? Can you have a Christian table? Um, can you have a Christian building? Can you have a Christian song? These are all just things that we make, right? So can we or can we not? What does that even mean? And uh, I don't think there's any doubt that, let, let's stick with buildings right now, <clears throat> that structure and architecture is um, is transformative, some people have said. It's part of culture, right there uh, alongside faith and community and other things we do. Um, just to kind of throw a... Oh, if my slideshow will work. Hold on. Here we go. Just to throw a few uh, things in front of you. Um, this building was designed in the Bauhaus architectural style. Actually, I think this is where the Bauhaus architects were trained. And um, the Bauhaus movement was very strongly connected. Its architectural themes were very strongly connected to a particular worldview, like a particular way of seeing the world, a particular philosophy. You can see all the lines are very like straight, geometric. Everything is gray and drab. Uh, everything is extremely functional. And uh, and that was what these architects prized. They were showing that they were getting rid of the like more flowery, non-essential, you know, aspects of beauty. That this is strict function, form, geometry, line, shape, and that's it. Okay, this um, this next one. This is the. Uh, the train station at Flinders Street Station in Melbourne, where I grew up. And again, different architectural style, very different. Uh, this building still looks very much like in this. I don't know if this is a real historical picture or not, but I thought it was kind of fun. Um, and this has a, a dome. It's got big archways. It's made of brick. It's got uh, a clock right in the middle. There's a whole lot to be said here about like, what is the purpose? What were the designers thinking? What did they value? What did they prize when they did this? Okay, so architecture and culture are very strongly connected. 
all the things we make. This slide, this is a slide that I chose. Someone sat down and designed these slide backgrounds I've been using this whole way so far. These shapes, colors, they were made by a person and it does give you a clue into what that person prized. How did they think? What was their worldview? This person seems to have favored maybe simplicity. Maybe it was an office worker trying to churn out a bunch of quick templates for um, Microsoft PowerPoint. So they were prizing, uh, like sim you know, as, as I say, like simplicity, geometry, uh, efficiency, uh, non-distraction. But, but it still says something about value and what is important because you think of all the ways that it could have been. It was uh, Winston Churchill. I hope you've at least heard of this guy. Um, British Prime Minister uh, during the war years. Uh, World War II, do I have that correct? Someone correct me if I'm wrong. Um, he said, we shape our buildings. Thereafter, they shape us. I like that. We shape our buildings, but thereafter, they shape us. So I want you to keep all these ideas in mind about, you know, buildings, architecture, the things we make. Um, can they be Christian? They're definitely not neutral. They're dripping with value and ideas. Um, maybe you've never just thought of it in that way, but that's, that's where we're going with this. We have talked about um, trusses recently. Okay, here's a truss bridge. It's going over a river. I think it's been painted red, probably to rust proof it. Here's another truss bridge. Um, this one is asymmetrical. Some of you have been asking about asymmetrical designs. Here you go. Here are some. Those are trusses, asymmetrical. Uh, some are above the roadway, some are below. This one, also back to the over the river. This is what you might call one of those bowstring ones. It looks like an upside down bow. Um, we've got those vertical elements. we got diagonal elements and the roadways underneath. So, you know, we, we might say that some of these truss bridges they're all truss bridges we might say that they're like more or less efficient we might say they're more or less attractive i don't know you know you could throw a whole lot of adjectives but would you describe any of these truss bridges as being more or less christian is this truss bridge a christian truss bridge is it more christian than this one or than this one. There's so many, so many things that can be said here. And these are questions that people uh, don't often ask. That's why it's kind of fun to dig into this today. So here are some possible answers that I've heard over the years. Uh, some of these have come from students, some things that I've heard or read. So first answer could be an emphatic no. You cannot have a a uh, Christian song or a Christian building or a Christian trust bridge. Just don't even use that adjective to describe. And in, for that instance, you know, don't call it a, a Muslim building. A mosque is not a Muslim building. It's a building where Muslims meet. You can't have a Muslim bridge or a Muslim song. You know, that's, that's one possible answer. Some people would say... Um, it's all about the purpose. What is the structure? What is the building? What is the piece of furniture? What is it designed for? That is what makes it Christian or not, or atheist or not, or Muslim or not. Some might say it has a lot to do with the quality of design. If something is built well, if you have a, you know, once heard it said, you know, if Jesus was a carpenter, okay, or at least he worked with his hands in some way. That's what the Greek word says. He was a, a technon, a technician. He worked with his hands, probably a carpenter or maybe a stonemason. If you sat in a chair that Jesus made, do you think it would collapse under your weight or do you think it would hold you up strong? You know, if Jesus would have made a chair that did its job. So the quality of construction, I've heard some people say, that is linked to whether you would properly call this a Christian structure or not. By contrast, if it's shoddily built, if it's falling apart, 
whoa, that, that couldn't be a Christian structure. Um, if a song is badly written or badly performed, eh, maybe it's not a Christian song. Challenging things to think about. Um, some might say that it is about the, <clears throat> the person who designed it. You know, we said with John Foreman, he was maybe challenging the idea. You can have a Christian write a song. Does that make it a Christian song? I don't know. Uh, if, uh, if a Christian designed this bridge, does that make it a Christian bridge? You could say it's about the efficiency of the design. Um, this design here might be considered way more kind of bare bones. You know, less steel to make it than this. Did they really need all that steel and concrete to get those cars across that waterway? Maybe not. Maybe they wasted more material than they needed. Is that a Christian thing to do, to waste? I don't know. <laughs> um, I think it might surprise you, as I, as I said, to learn that many people have thought about these ideas. And some structures and buildings have been absolutely considered to be Christian by their owners, by their architects, by the communities that use them. Okay, absolutely by all means. Like, yes, that is a Christian building. And let me tell you why. I once attended a lecture delivered by uh, this man here. His name is Christ Kamahes, if I'm hopefully saying that correctly. It's a Greek name. Christ as in like Christ. Uh, Kamahes. Don't know how that links into anything, but K-A-M-A-G-E-S. And he's an architect. And it's interesting because he's an architect who has devoted his entire, most of his, most of his professional career to one particular style of building. And that is Greek Orthodox. Okay, you might not have even ever set foot in or seen a Greek Orthodox building, but that is the one style that for most of Christ's career he has worked in. Here are some of the ones that he has designed as the architect. And by the way, uh, he's considered to be top of his field. He's won many, many, many awards, um, many laudations. Uh, most of his buildings, I believe, maybe all of them, are in the United States. But these ones I'm showing you now are Greek Orthodox meeting centers. There's another one. Uh, I think this one was in Florida, if I'm remembering correctly. And there's another one. Made of kind of brick sort of things, got those gabled and hipped roofs everywhere. And then I'm purposely refraining from saying too much about these, by the way, um, because I don't want to say too much yet. So Chris Kamahes designed these and he spoke in his lecture about how there are very particular elements of Greek Orthodox uh, culture, religion, um, which are very central. Firstly, Christ is at the center. Okay, Christ is at the center. A very fitting then that your architect's name is Christ, the guy who designs it, different Christ. Uh, Jesus Christ is at center. In the Orthodox tradition, there is a very important principle of light, you know, like the photons that come through the window. Light is critical. Another important aspect of Greek Orthodox culture is community. And, you know, naturally, I think all churches should be about community, but this is particularly true. Um, everything is centered around community and uh, I'm sure meals. I don't know. I'm, I'm picturing <laughs> dancing, people with violins. Maybe I'm, I'm thinking of Fiddler on the Roof here. Um, nothing to do with Greek Orthodox. But you can see how those aspects, Christ at the center, light and community, or I don't know, maybe you can't see, how those have fed into the designs that he has done. Uh, I promise you, he had these things and other aspects too at the center of mind as he put pen to paper as he used his computer programs. Um, that's what's going on here. Now, in the same presentation, uh, Chris Kamahes 
spoke about how really all of these buildings, the ones that he's done, and then also ones that others have done, I'm talking all around the world, for the last 1,500 years, all of these buildings draw their ultimate roots and inspiration from one particular building. A particular historical building which happens, fortunately, to still be in existence. It's still there. You can go to it. Uh, Mr. Hurt has traveled and seen it, and he says it is absolutely breathtaking. And its name is Hagia Sophia. Hagia Sophia. That is spelled H-A-I-G-A, if you're looking this up. S-O-P-H-I-A. H-A-I-G-A. S-O-P-H-I-A. And that's it right there. Uh, I believe it is in modern day Turkey. Mr. Hurt was uh, living in Turkey at the time. And without exaggeration, like I said, this building, this one you're looking at here, it looks a little bit like something from the planet Naboo. This building inspired countless um Islam structures, there I go, I called an Islam building, an Islamic building. Islamic buildings are Christian buildings, Orthodox buildings. Um, anytime you've kind of seen anything that looks like this, including the palace on Naboo, it came from this. Like this was the first one of its kind with that kind of scale and that kind of structure um, that really just made this dome idea take off. Um as well as the overall thing, which, which I'll, I'll get into as well. And very few buildings can said to have uh, derived so much inspiration from, um, sorry, can be said to have given so much inspiration to so many others. Uh, Gothic architecture, Renaissance architecture, they all trace their roots back to this one building in Turkey. So uh, a few things about it. It was built in 536 AD. All right. Uh, so it was built you know, after Christ, the original, not Kama Hes. It is 14 stories high. Okay, pretty big. It was built over a period of five years, which I think is so impressive. Something of this magnitude. Look, look at this thing. Five years they built this back then with no cranes or anything like that i mean how did they even like it's it's tempting to think you look at these outside pictures like maybe it's um kind of solid and there's just like a big solid thing on top but no you look at this interior picture the whole point of this is the whole inside is open and by the way this is this is the number one problem of historical architecture that had to be solved. How do you span a space so that you can live under it, gather under it, be sheltered under it? How do you set up two walls? Walls are easy. Anyone can throw two or four walls up. But how do you span something across it that is uh, able to be gotten there in the first place, is not going to break, is going to give a, a smooth, consistent surface that keeps the weather out, um, Maybe let's light in, maybe it has decorative elements, but just like how do you cover yourself from the elements across a space that is longer than a, uh, you know, log? Because logs really only go so far. Um, so this dome idea, the dome was one of those historical solutions to that problem, and it's quite a successful solution. That's why we see it everywhere, all over the place, all around the world, mostly inspired by Hagia Sophia. So um, let's get into some of the, the uh, elements of this that uh, Mr. Kamahes described as being so critical. So firstly, the dome. So you have this dome on top, and then it comes down, and then it sits on this square structure all around it okay you can kind of just see the hint of um what you're seeing in this slide 
you're just seeing the bottom of the dome right at the very top, that kind of bluish ring. That's actually the dome. Oh, there it is. Great. Um, that's the dome up above it. So the dome sits there. And then the dome is resting on these other kind of like arches. And then there's little little mini domes coming out from it. You see it's like a little dome, dome, dome. And so the idea is that God is head over the church. And then you have like, I suppose, church leadership hierarchy, I think is what he said. Uh, those other mini domes with other domes under them, like, you know, that's your, your bishops and apostles and so on, all coming under the head and all kind of supporting, feeding up and connected to each other. It's kind of cool when you, when you start to think about those ideas. Um, this dome is said to be, in the Orthodox tradition, they describe it as being pierced with light. Okay, pierced, like like a needle pierces something. Pierced with light. There are 40 windows around that upper dome. Okay, in this image, obviously, you can probably count about 20 because you can see half. And it's very, very intentional. The light is coming through from outside. And they actually... Um, really intentionally didn't fill those with anything. There's no like stained glass um, as you would find on many modern church buildings. The whole point here is that you've got diffused light coming straight through. Sometimes in these buildings, there's actually alabaster, which is so thin as to be translucent. Alabaster is a sort of a stone kind of substance. Um, and what this does, this illuminates all the mosaics that are everywhere. Uh, it is also, um, I, I believe it's reminiscent of like Christ being pierced for us. Also, as we said, light itself is um, is central to the Orthodox tradition. Okay, like light is spoken of in scripture as, um, you know, God, first act of God, let there be light. Okay, light is energy. Uh, light is the first thing that God created. Uh, God is light, the Bible even says. Or he dwells in unapproachable light. So, um, again, critical. We are illuminated from a light outside of us, not by ourselves. Um, now, inside, there are, as I said, there are mosaics everywhere. I don't know if I, there we go. There's like just so much decoration. It's very complex. Um, there's pictures of historical figures and all sorts of things. Now, you might have also noticed, by the way, the Arabic symbols um, hanging on those huge, I don't know what those are, banners or shields they look like. Um, so Hagia Sophia, uh, I believe, in the modern era is actually a, uh, a, a Muslim-dominated area. And so it has been turned into a Muslim place of worship, not a, an Orthodox. But the building structure still remains. Um, let's see. The, uh, the dome also represents uh, Christian theology. The dome is a circle without beginning or end, so it represents eternity. And then even down the bottom, they didn't have solid pews. They didn't have like anchored pews for people to sit in, uh, you know, so that the uh, teacher or speaker, uh, the, the bishop can uh, preach. They preferred to have removable chairs because, again, the uh, focus of Greek orthodoxy on, um, sorry, not, not, not just Greek, but orthodox church culture of community. This intentionally big, wide open space is there so that you can practice community. Um, before this building, it was common to have like a cross-shaped building. Okay, like if you could have flown over with a drone, you would have seen that the whole building was in the shape of a cross. And, you know, that was chosen because, well, Christ died on the cross. So there we go. Let's have a cross-shaped building. But having those wings going out in the four directions actually uh, didn't help community. You know, you've got like four separate areas. And when you're deep in one, you can't even see two of them at any given time. So this big open space, intentionally open to foster community. These are all choices that the architects of Hagia Sophia made to match and blend theology, practicality, style, beauty, um, 
shelter, like all these different aspects. And so that's why this is such a, a resounding success that, as I say, inspired so many other buildings of all different traditions for the next uh, 1,500 years. I don't think I am ever going to do anything which is still standing or being talked about in 1,500 years, but it happens. So just to give some uh, concluding thoughts here, we asked the question at the start, <clears throat> can you have a Christian building? Can you have a Christian truss bridge? Can you have a Christian piece of furniture? I'm out there in the garage. I, I was early today uh, building the different bits and pieces for Gil Addison's um, moving computer desk. It's a piece of furniture. Can you have a Christian piece of furniture? And so just to recap, here are some of the answers. Um, firstly, I think I do agree with John Foreman. I think only a person can be a Christian. But I think that the uh, manner in which something is designed, the purpose something is designed for, those can bring glory to God. Those can be useful and worshipful. And I do believe that anything we bring to God as a sacrifice to him um, can be pleasing to him. No matter what that is, including buildings and things that we make, uh, the purpose it's built for, the elements of design can also remind us of particular things about God and his kingdom. And that, that was an intentional choice, as we said for, here for Hagia Sophia. Um, so I do think those are good answers that respond back to the question. And those are good things. Those are, are fundamentally good things. So I hope I've made you think a little bit. I, uh, <clears throat> I also do want to want to transition here. I'm going to exit out of this if we can do that. And I'm going to switch right over to our whiteboard because I thought there are a few really good questions this week about, um, I'm just going to do a little transition thing here. A few really good questions about, uh, the defamation that I was talking about with the truss bridge. I've got a slightly different pen today, so I really hope this works. But, you know, we talked about, hey, what if you have a bridge here and you want a really quick um, estimate of, like, what's in tension, what's in compression? And we said, okay, well, if something pulls down on it, so we're pulling that middle one, we know that middle pin is going to be deflected down probably... Uh, this one's going to be deflected somewhere as well. And then if we kind of reconnect those, those end ones don't move. We said to ourselves, you know what? I really think that we can kind of estimate what's happening. And, you know, in this case, we'd say, well, I think these top ones are all being compressed. They're actually getting a little shorter. We can see that even in this basic, basic sketch. And then all of these ones... Uh, being stretched longer than they were so that is tension okay and that was done quickly easily without any mathematics or any uh, even conceptual free body diagrams of the joints so people had great questions like what what what's the nature of that defamation some people ask do you need math to work that out can it be worked out um, does it depend on how much load there is um, Let's see, uh, I remember Sam asked, you know, because this thing is flexing and bending, can we even call it a static analysis anymore? The answer is yes, it's still static. Everything is still balanced, just the shape is changing, but it's all balanced. Um, so, super quick lesson here. Everything about a solid structure that flexes, stretches, compresses, it's all governed by a very simple principle called Hooke's Law. All right, and if we did the full, um, the full 
statics and structures course that I normally do. This would have absolutely been a part of it. So I'm just kind of throwing this one in here. Hooke's Law is it's very simple. It's this right here. It says F equals KX. Okay. F is force. K is what we call the spring constant. And X is a distance. And you might say, wait a minute, wait a minute. I think I remember this. I remember this. This was back from the first semester. This was our, our very brief little unit on springs. It was so brief, you might have even forgotten it, but it should be in your notes somewhere. We said, yeah, you know what? When you have uh, a spring um, and it gets stretched, that's the force of the tension or the compression. Uh, you've got a spring constant, and then it goes a particular distance. So, yeah, this is the exact same thing. This bridge is actually... A giant spring and it doesn't matter if it's built of steel or um, pine wood or aluminium there I said it or uh, carbon fiber rods it doesn't matter if it's big or small it is a giant spring it's a very kind of complex spring it's made of multiple members it's a weird shape but you know so are curly little springs as well the point is that if I, let's say that I applied 1 million Newtons, and please, this is why we learned our uh, prefixes and suffixes and things, 1 mega Newton, capital M, 1 mega Newton means a million Newtons. If I applied a million Newtons to this bridge, let's say that we had a little, a little ruler out and we found that under a million newtons, that middle bridge pin deflected down by five millimeters. Let's say that you could do that. You could with the right equipment, It'd be possible. You could measure that. Um, <clears throat> so if that one million newtons caused a five millimeter deflection, the point here is that if you then pulled on it with two mega newtons, double the force, you are going to see a deflection of, can you guess, 10 millimeters, double, okay? If you double the force, you're gonna double the deflection. Critical idea, but any kind of solid object, which uh, can be like, you know, compressed and stretched, which is pretty much everything except jello and oobleck and uh, water, you know, but like solid rigid things, they all follow this rule. Now they follow this rule until they don't. They follow Hooke's law until they break, snap, until the fibers inside are stretched beyond repair. But for small deformations and everyday kind of deformations, uh, Hooke's law is actually pretty darn accurate. And, you know, in this case here, we could actually go through and work out some things. Let's say we said, um, okay, force is one million newtons. K is the unknown spring constant. X is the deformation from the original resting place. Oh, let me think here. I had to think for a second there, making sure I'm getting my five millimeters converted to meters properly. See that what I'm doing, I'm turning everything into SI units, base units. One million and then 0 0.005 in meters. And then I would divide these. And you'll forgive me if I'm doing this. I just don't trust myself to quickly give you the right answer and get this absolutely correct. K would be, is that 200 million? 200 newtons, 
two, two, what am I saying? 200 million newtons per meter. Okay, the units for K, we looked at these um, back when we did springs first semester. It's always force per distance. Okay, newtons per millimeter. Um, so 200 million. Now, yes, it is absolutely acceptable if you wish to write 200 mega newtons per meter. That would be a good idea. Um, but there it is. And then you would be able to then feed that. You would then take that and say, oh, look, now I know. Yeah, let's use that. Let's use the mega newtons. Um, now I have like a like a Hooke's law formula. Um, and now I can take any force. For example, I could take, like this is net now because I've solved my spring constant. Now I could take that that two mega newton that I can say, hey, what if I have a two mega newton force? What's my deformation going to be? We already know that it is going to be two divided by two hundred is going to be point oh one. By the way, I hope you notice what I'm doing here. Um, I used mega newtons and I used mega newtons per meter, so they're speaking to each other correctly. I'm just trying to not write a bunch of zeros. But the final answer is measured in meters. 10 millimeters is the same thing as 0 0.01 meters. Okay, but the main idea here, the big point of deformation and deflection is that it is always proportional to the load. If you double it, you get double the deflection. If you triple it, you get triple the deflection. Um, now, if you wanted to get right into it and say, well, Mr. Neath, we just worked out that this particular member of a bridge, you know, let, let's say you just did one of your free body diagrams and you found that your member has a compressive force of a thousand newtons acting on it. Because that was the kind of stuff that we were coming up with when we were doing our free body diagrams these past couple of weeks. You know, this member or this joint has this many newtons acting on it. It is also possible to take this and say, what is the spring constant of this particular member? This is not the whole bridge now, but like treating each member as its own spring, doing its own thing based on the tension or compression forces that are happening to it. Here's a nice complex formula for you. That spring constant K is given by E times A times L. Now, what are those? Well, E is something called Young's modulus. It is a, a it's a property of the material, kind of like you know, steel has a particular density. Um, steel has a particular specific heat capacity. Steel has a particular hardness. Steel also has a particular Young's modulus, which um, it's an intrinsic property. It doesn't scale up bigger or smaller with having more or less of it. It's just part of what it is, um, like, like density. A is the cross-sectional area, okay, like as in if you were to slice through this thing and look at the end, like, you know, what's, what's the shape of the cross-section? And then L is the length of it, okay? Two of those things you'd be able to do pretty readily. You could find the cross-sectional area of simple shapes, be they rectangles, tubes, hollow tubes, whatever, you can measure the length of things because you're not silly. Young's modulus, you don't have any experience with yet, but um, it, it's, it's just like a measure of how stiff and springy a particular material is. And you can actually just look it up. If you had a question on this, you would look it up and you would find that steel, wait a minute, yes, steel has a Young's modulus of 210 gigapascals. Giga, well, let me get this right. 
Giga is a thousand millions. I think I have that right. We have kilo, mega, giga. Yeah, yeah. Why am I second guessing myself? Okay. Uh, Pascal's it simply means newtons per meter squared. Anyway, steel is 210. You know, it's just like a number that you look up, just like you would look up density or something for something, some other kind of problem. Okay, so there it is. That's all I want to get into. This is a little bit of a shorter video than usual. It doesn't really feed into the assignment. The assignment this week um, actually ties back into some of the furniture stuff and applies some of their knowledge to the current furniture projects with Gil and Mrs. Jones. But this Hooke's Law stuff was uh, just, you know, that many of you asking and that important of an idea that I quickly wanted to mention it. So that is it. I wish you well. Uh, good luck on the assignment. And don't forget to leave some comments on the discussion board. And you might like this week to say something intelligent about the idea. Can you have a Christian building? Thanks a lot. See you guys later.